Oppression, oppression is everywhere in our world. Um, if you looked at, at that missionary I was talking about uh, earlier's newsletter about that place that they visited that we can't talk about, uh, they had blacked out the faces of the people that they were talking to because of fear of repercussions uh, and oppression. Um, we were visiting some friends of ours on vacation, and they were talking about their daughter, who was a, a, a person who had Christian work to do in a country in which we were recently at war and sort of still are, um, uh, whose capital starts with a K. Uh, and they had, they had people in their apartment complex, you know, killed uh, because they served the Lord. Uh, we can't talk about those places because those countries monitor the Internet and they, they look to see what, who's talking about what and, and um, they don't like us to be there, but we're there anyway. Oppression. But there's also oppression everywhere you go. Uh, if, if you just look at our prayer list. Um, we, have, we have some senior citizens that we are praying for because we have elder abuse and we have... Uh, uh, a wife that we're praying for because there's spouse abuse and there's childhood abuse and there's, wherever we go, there's oppression in this world. In your life, we're oppressed by, by bosses, we're oppressed by, um, by people in the community. I, I've, I've been updating my, my um, uh, ability to go out at the prison. I have to take training each year and I had to sit through an hour of of how not to treat people, uh, you know, and, and take a test to make sure that I didn't oppress them. There's oppression everywhere, and and we ha and uh, Solomon uh, recognized that for certain. He brings up the topic again because he mentioned it back in chapter in back in chapter three, uh, and told us that there is oppression in this world, but that God was going to bring us justice, and he reminds us of that. Uh, he talked about the injustice and said that God's justice would prevail, that he would make things right uh, eventually. Oppression can come from many sources. It's not just overseas, it's here. It's not just um, outside the church, it's, in, it's inside as well. And we can oppress other people unwittingly or wittingly. Uh, even if we're good people, we can oppress others or people can oppress us. The entire Old Testament just harps on this continually about people who were oppressing others that they had power over. Uh, and that's one of the, the main things that, that Solomon talks about is this abuse of power. Uh, and that's one of the great sources of oppression in the world. It should also be remembered that God sometimes brings oppression. He did in the case of Job. Uh, there were other people in the, in the Bible that God oppressed. At one point, he, he's having a meeting with all of his angels. They're having a planning meeting on Monday morning, I'm sure. And, and um, God says, you know, I really want to cause that guy some grief. Who wants to go and do that for me? And, and one angel goes, yeah, I'll do that for you. Uh, going, well, what kind of angel is that? Uh, but God sometimes brings oppression, or uh, probably more, like, uh, more accurately, he, he permits it. He allows it to happen. But oppression comes from all over the place. In Solomon's view, oppression is the evil extreme of the command to go into all the world and, and, and subdue it. And so, but when people subdue it in, in self-seeking, brutal, oppressive ways, that's wrong. Instead of reacting like God does in giving ways, in loving ways. And so they're, just, they're fulfilling that command, they're just doing it in the wrong way. Those oppressing the poor are insulting their creator, Proverbs tells us. When we, when we persecute those who have less power than we do, when we oppress others, we are persecuting the God who made them. And God says we need to, to treat them like the creator treats us in this world. Now, we've already been told that we have a hope. Back in chapter 3, said that God makes all things beautiful in its time, and he said that justice would prevail, that God would, would uh, provide justice for us, maybe not in this world, but certainly in the next, in a certain amount of justice in this world. 
But we still have to wait for that beautiful time. We still have times of oppression. We still have times when injustice is just rampant. And we need to deal with that. We have to look that squarely in the face and learn how to, to feel about it, learn how to react to it and what we're supposed to do about it. Solomon is not a fatalist. He just doesn't think this is going to happen. But he can't do anything about the instances that he's talking about. Now, I don't know what's going on. Maybe there are people from other countries that have fled to Jerusalem and want to talk to Solomon and get his take on certain things that are happening in their home kingdoms. Uh, but I don't think he's just saying, oh, yeah, no, uh, you know, there's going to be oppression all the time, so we're not going to do anything about it. Uh, we're just going to moan about it. Uh, he would do something if he could. Uh, I firmly believe that. Solomon would fix the impression in his own kingdom, but there are situations that he just cannot change. One of the things that we have to watch out for in talking to people who are suffering and being oppressed is the easy answer. And Solomon does not give an easy answer. He just doesn't glib about this whole thing. He feels for the person. He, he has, has empathy for these folks. The poor, in Proverbs it says, the poor plead for mercy, but the rich answer with insults. And I'm not even sure that these are insults. They just might be, well, you know, you buttered your bread, now lie in it. Uh, you deserve this situation. Uh, the poor we will always have with us. Um, you know, it's just your lack of faith that you don't feel well. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things that we say to people who are suffering. And the first thing that Solomon tells us we should do is to understand that they are in pain. Verses 2 and 3, Solomon tells us how he felt about those people, uh, feels with those people in their oppression. The dead are happier than the living. <laughs> Uh, yeah, last October, uh, there were some moments in there I'm going, it'd be better to be dead. <laughs> There's a lot of pain in this world, and, and you've been through those kinds of painful situations. You know, and there are just times when it, you know that it would be better to be dead than, than alive. Um, now, I think we have to be careful with this statement because this only refers to believers. Uh, to non-believers, they are much better off in this world than in the next um, because the next world is just eternal torment uh, for a non-believer. Um, and so when, when somebody go, comes to me and says, oh, they're, they're much better off, at least their suffering is over, I'm going, that's not necessarily the case. We have to be careful about that. But dying is not always a curse. It can be a deliverance. And for those of us who have had elderly parents who suffer through, through long periods of, of disease and, and pain, you know that, that suffering, uh, that, that death can be a deliverance. Paul says the same thing in Philippians chapter 1. For to me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. It's a good thing to go to heaven. That's a good thing. Uh, we're not given that choice. We're supposed to leave that choice up to God. But sometimes the end of this life can be a deliverance, and, and Solomon recognizes that. He goes on to say that it's even better to postpone birth uh, until the oppression is past. You know, he knows that, that oppression will, will, will come and, and go. He knows that it won't last forever. And so he's, he's recommending that, you know, just wait a while on bringing children to the, into this world if, if the oppression is going on. Because it's better that if they never saw it to begin with. Um, verse 4 gives us a small little shift. Um, he, sa he starts talking about working. Working is, is, is a good thing, but it's often envied by others. And as Rhett read for us, envy is the problem of a lot of, the start of a lot of the problems in this world. Uh, adding this statement about working and, and envy uh, to what we've previously had, we know that a lot of the fruit of our labors is going to be taken away. You know, uh, we can plant fruit trees and we can plant gardens and we know that the coons are going to get half the corn and we know <laughs> that... Uh, you know, uh, the bugs are going to get a bunch of it, and, and even if we get that, 
Uh, well, we may not be able to enjoy it because we lost our teeth or something. I don't know. <laughs> it, we know that the, the, even the fruit of our labors is, is, can be taken away from us very quickly. And Solomon reminds us that envy is the reason for much of the oppression in the world. I'm not saying it's, it's, res, it's not responsible for some good things. Okay, you, you uh, envy a person uh, their nice house, and so you go get a, a better job, and you work hard, and, and that's a good thing. Okay, working hard is a good thing. But envy can cause a lot of the problems, and does cause a lot of the problems in our world. Solomon recommends moderation. Uh, this is his, his take on this whole issue. Don't be so envious of your neighbors or of people down the street that you have to have things and you start to oppress them and bully them for the things that they have. Have a little moderation in your life. Solomon starts about talking about the imbalanced, uh, talking about imbalanced living. The fool, who is way out of, it, out of balance, is too lazy to oppress anyone. Hey, that's good. I don't oppress anybody. Uh, and, he's, and he's too lazy to be envious of anybody. But now, Solomon isn't recommending being lazy. He says that's foolish. But he's recommending balance in this world. Diligence is recommended, but even diligence needs to be put into balance. You can't just spend your life working. You can't just spend your life striving after things and not enjoying them. And Solomon says, put them into balance. He says, fools ruin themselves. And then better one handful with a little bit of enjoyment than two handfuls with just hard work. He says you need both things, hard work and some enjoyment, some relaxation. If you work too hard, you won't have any time to enjoy your labor. <laughs> you know, you're always there at work, and, 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 and what, what are you doing it for? When we work, we have a, a, a goal in mind. One is to provide for our families. The second is to provide for people in need. The third is to provide for the church. You know, we have goals in mind. It just can't be that we are working for working's sake. Rest is good too, but it has to be earned. Now, if you're just lazy and you just sit there and, and you haven't earned your, your vacation, you haven't earned your period of rest, that's not good. That's not what Paul, uh, Solomon is recommending. He's recommending that you earn your work, but that you enjoy your rest. That you enjoy your rest. He wants all of your work, all of your enjoyment to be done in time, in its season. Uh, in moderation. In the next verses, we see a solitary man who works hard, but he doesn't spend any time enjoying it, and he doesn't have anybody to leave it to. He doesn't have any goal for what he, why he's working so hard. And this is another form of oppression, that he is a, he's a actually oppressing himself. And I think this is the bad thing about this, because uh, his, his oppression is self-imposed. You know, in, in the previous one, it's those people who envy you that are taking away the things that you have that are, are impos imposing the oppression. Now he's just doing it to himself. He's not, he's not uh, living in right relationship uh, to his work and his, his ease. This guy doesn't even accept God's gifts. He doesn't accept them and enjoy them. Spends no time enjoying what God has given to him. He has two handfuls of, of hard work rather than one handful of work and one handful of enjoyment. This is what Solomon is, is recommending, that we enjoy the seasons of life, that we enjoy the week, you know, and you can't just spend all of your time working. Now, there are times when you have to spend all of your time working, you know, when the harvest is in, you've got to go out there and get the harvest. You know, if, if, if uh, there's a break in the rain, yeah, you've got to go plant and you've got to work hard. Uh, but... Solomon is telling us that you can't do that all the time. You have to spend some time working and some time enjoying the fruits of your labor. This guy needs to learn moderation. He needs to learn enjoyment. There are some people who just cannot take a break, uh, and they need to learn how to relax in this world. Now, it may be that, uh, that working relaxes you. Uh, Doug was saying that he was on vacation last week, uh, sweating his, his uh, shirt off in, in, the, in the heat in uh, southern Missouri. Ooh, vacation time. <laughs> uh, sometimes working hard is a vacation uh, and, and is a nice thing to do. So far, we, so far we've seen several kinds of oppression. We have seen 
uh, the oppression of one person against another, and we've seen oppression against having an imbalanced life in, a, in your relationship with yourself. Uh, Solomon moves on uh, to, to tell us about the opposite of those kinds of oppression, and he talks about the advantages of companionship. He talks about the advantages of cooperation. So here we see some, some of the means that, that uh, we need to use to get to that balance in our life. We need to use these things so that we will have enjoyment in this world and we will have the, uh, be able to enjoy the fruit of, of our labor. He says two are better than one because they have a good. He goes on to talk about some economic good. But that's, the, that's uh, his statement. You know, what is good in this world? What does have meaning in this world? He, well, he says uh, two are better than one because they will have a good. Now, he says sometimes you can lose. You know, he understands that. But he is recommending that you join with other people. And that will help you to succeed in this world. Marriage is a good thing because you have two people who are joined working for the same goals. Uh, it is a good thing. I don't know what he, what he means by uh, three are better than two. I don't think he's recommending polygamy. Uh, but he's saying that two are, are better than the sum of their parts. Two have economic and, and security value. He's saying that when you have two people working together, that you can attain more economically than you can just working with by yourself. Uh, and, and this is true almost on any job that you have. If you have two people uh, working, you can get far more done than if you have two people working singly. And there's also security value. If one person trips and falls, the other person can pick them up, uh, can help them out. They've got your back. There are some other things. There's protection against all kinds of enemies. There's warmth. Uh, you know, two crawling underneath that blanket. It's very nice and warm and cozy. Uh, there's comfort. There's victory. You know, I like to watch action movies. Uh, you know, and uh, I saw one recently where, where one guy was going to go up and fight five guys, and these five guys uh, are all coming after him. And he says, well, no, I'm not really fighting one against five. I'm fighting one against three. And the guy says, why do you figure that? And he says, well, the last two guys are going to run. After I beat you guys up, you know, they're just going to take off. So it's really one against three. Well, it's not even one against three because they don't tackle him three on one. They tackle him one at a time. Now, the prison, you know, teaches much better than that. They, <laughs> they get five guys and they, they all gang up on you and they, they attack you at once. Well, that's, you know, what, what Solomon is recommending. You know, he's saying two, three, work together. You know, you got each other's backs. You can solve the problems. You can have victory in this world. It's not just one-on-one -on -one where you can lose in this, in this life. And if two are good, three have even more advantages. Now, you remember from our book and our study in the book of Proverbs that, yeah, you can have too many friends. You can, you know, you can be betrayed by friends. You can be betray, betrayed by these partnerships that you have, but generally speaking, two are better than one, and you can have an advantage, and this is a good thing in this life. Solomon moves from oppression to isolation to cooperation, and then he moves to substitution, which he also sees as an oppressive thing. We see two or three kings. Actually, it, it's, the scholars have, a, have they argue a, a lot about how many kings are mentioned in, the, in, this, um, in this paragraph, whether it was two or whether it was three, and some say one and some say the other. But what happens is, is that they're coming into, into their thrones in succession. One is taking the place of another. Each king loses his position to another, and Solomon sees this thing as an oppression as well because you're never sure who's going to take your place. He, he tells us, though, in, in, in this cycle of, of substitution that wisdom is better than foolishness. You know, and he's saying that, that even if you're on the, at the top of your game and you're the king, if you're not wise, if you're not listening, if you're not having other people who will stand with you, you can lose and, and become oppressed yourself. So even if you're at the top of the world, you can become oppressed. The problem with this king is that he's not teachable. He doesn't listen. He doesn't have any friends to listen to. Uh, he, doesn't have any, he doesn't listen to God. He is just simply not teachable. And because he's not teachable, he will lose everything that he has. And then he reminds, Solomon reminds us that even a, a wise king will be forgotten. 
So what advantage is there? This is all in his, his looking at oppression. The adva this advances uh, Solomon's statements by telling us that moderation is, with wisdom is good even for kings. You know, even a king needs to, to back off. Uh, even a king needs to have help. Even a king uh, needs to have balance in his life because even a king's uh, life is only temporary. So we've had three sections on human relationships, and now we move on to a, a section on the, our relationship with God. Solomon changes his tone from reflective, oh, this is a bad thing, I really feel sorry for you, to you need to behave differently. You need to watch what you do when you're talking to God. The picture here is, <laughs> is, this, is, is this idiot who thinks that he can, has a fantasy about bribing God. Well, if I just give God a bunch of money, he's going to give me a bunch of money back. And, and if I just pray with this certain way, well, then he has to do this for me. It's a fantasy world. God is not bribed. God understands our hearts. But this guy tries it anyway. Now, it is commendable to bring sacrifices and make vows. It is commendable to do, to do Christian works. It's commendable to go out as missionaries. It's commendable uh, to give offering. It's commendable to pray. It's commendable. But um, we need to do it for the heart from God. The temple was a place for listening to God, to listening to what God had to say. It wasn't a, a place just for sacrificing and making vows. It was a place to listen to what God had to say. It was not a place to be rash and unthinking. Now, we don't have a temple anymore because God has moved into our hearts. So God is everywhere that you want to be. So God is, is telling us, don't ever think about me in rash and unthinking ways. You can't uh, bluff me. You can't fool me. You can't deceive me. You can't trick me. We need to treat God uh, in with a very uh, a lot of sincerity. This guy thinks he can make a deal with God. Oh God, you know, if you just heal me, I'll become a minister. Oh God, if you just do this for me, I will contribute lots of money. You know, no. God wants your heart and life, and He will accept nothing less. This fool's tendency is to talk and and uh, to and not walk, and that may lead to God's anger. I don't know that Solomon is saying that he's going to be punished. But he says that God has a very good chance of being angry if we do not walk our talk. Sacrifices that are made without a heart for God are never acceptable to God. You can give your body to be burned. And, and if you don't have love and if your heart isn't right, it's not acceptable to God. Obedience, it says in the Old Testament, it says in the New Testament, is better than sacrifice. And that's why at communion, he says, if you have something against somebody uh, in the community and you're, you're having communion, leave church and go solve that because obedience is better than sacrifice. In the story about the king, it was his inability to listen that led to his downfall. In this story about this guy walking into the temple, it is his inability to listen that leads to his downfall and leads to oppression. The same is true with our relationship with God. We need to listen. God is not a peer with whom we can just run off at the mouth. Now, I think you ought to talk to God, and I think you ought to talk to God naturally and normally and, and, and say to him whatever you want, but he is not going to be bluffed by you. Psalm 46.10 says, Shut up and know that I am God. That's, that's in Rhett's aversion. Uh, <laughs> really, that's what it says. Shut up. Quit talking. Uh, I should listen to myself. The dreams that we see in verse 3 may be the dreams that the fool wants to, to see, but really he can't pull off. Solomon then changes from sacrifices to vows, and, and he says basically the same thing. Um, and I'll skip those. Finally, he says, what, do you, what can you do then? If it's not sacrifices, if it's not vows, what are you supposed to do? Fear God. Listen to him. In our understanding of what... Proverbs says, and what Solomon says about the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the fear of the Lord is, is just simply saying, I trust your advice. I will trust what you do. I will listen to you. The last verses localize the oppression that we saw in, in verse 1 and the injustice that we talked about in, in chapter 3 within the realm of a good situation. 
So the last oppression that he talks about is oppression that happens in a place that is pretty good. What happens like in a church when something bad happens and one person oppresses another? What happens in a community where it's pretty good or one person oppresses another or a country? You know, oppression happens everywhere. There are sinners everywhere. And whether it's winning or unwitting, bad things can happen. So what happens there? Well, he reminds us that things are going along really well and that good things are happening. And that good things can happen, even if there is a, a, a area of oppression. And because, you know, you live in a good area, that means that, well, yeah, you know, uh, this oppression that I'm serving, that I'm suffering, is only going to last for a short time. It's only temporary. It's only localized. And we can have hope because we live in a a good country or we live in a good community or we have a good church. It also reminds us that local oppression can occur even in good places. No matter where you are, no matter how good a situation is, bad things can still happen. So how do we apply all of this? Relationships are the greatest blessing and provide the greatest challenges that we ever have to living wisely. Whether it's with a spouse, whether it's in a family, whether it's in a job, Relationships provide all of those blessings, but we have challenges in them. It is a horrible thing when people take advantage of those relationships and have envy and therefore ruin those relationships. But we still need to understand that that those relationships are a great blessing. When it comes to the church, sometimes we have been on the good side and sometimes we have been on the bad side. You know, in the Civil War, there were Christians that were saying, slavery is a great thing. The Bible says it is. And then there were people that saying, oh, we need to stop that. You know, we have a very mixed record. And, and yes, we're, I think the church is a good thing, but sometimes we have done some very horrible things. There is another oppression, oppressive condition, laboring through life without partners. We need to stand together. Uh, as, as, I don't remember who said it, Benjamin Franklin or somebody, if we don't hang together, we will certainly hang separately. We need to stand together. The strongest relationships are those formed in adversity. If you have gone through thick and thin with your partner, your community, your family, that is a a strong relationship. And under profound common experiences, we can change our life and we can have an impact for God in this world. Bad things happening to us are not necessarily a bad thing. We can grow through it. We can forge these relationships that we have through the bad things that happen in this world. The opposite of companionship is, is witting or unwitting competition where one wins and one loses. We can come to the place where we all survive and win. Now, competition in itself is not bad, but bullying and oppression are. Competition can, can accomplish a lot of things. But if we don't enjoy the fruits of our competition, what good is it? We especially ought to be in competition against foolishness. And in Proverbs and in Ecclesiastes and in Solomon, foolishness is anything evil. We need to be in competition against that. We have sent uh, the O'Donnells to Japan to, to minister on our behalf. I I heard this last week that Japan just did something amazing. They passed a law outlawing child pornography. What? This happened last week? And they just, they may have have outlawed child pornography, but they still haven't outlawed all of their child pornographic comic books that they love. This is evil. (laughs) And we ought to send the O'Donnells there to compete against that to stop stuff like that, to change the, the, that system one person at a time through the choices that we make, we ought to be in competition against foolishness. We ought to desire this world to become a better place. That's good competition. That's good competition. Finally, Solomon reminds us about our relationship with God. To rush into any event or responsibility thinking that we know what is best is just plain stupid. And then to think that God has to bless our stupidity is even more stupid. We need God to be involved in everything that we do, whether it's at home, whether it's at church, whether it's in our community. We need to ask God for his advice. We need to listen to God. 
We have to start that relationship, continue that relationship, and end that relationship by listening to God. He will tell us what's good in this world. God isn't interested so much in sacrifice as he is in our hearts. We have to remember that our relationship with God is not a hobby. It's not something that we can run into rashly. It's not something that we can enter into unwittingly. You know, we're not fans, as, as we've talked about in the high school group, and I think in some of the Sunday school classes. It's more than a hobby. Finally, we shouldn't be surprised by sinful people in a good organization. That should not cause us any, whoa, how did that happen? There are th people, even good people do bad things once in a while. And that should not surprise us. But we need to know that God is making that organization work. Remember, God will make all things beautiful in their time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you will make everything beautiful in its time. Lord, until then, we pray that we would understand that oppression is a horrible thing. We pray that you'd help us to be empathetic towards people who are suffering, that you'd help us to understand them, that you'd help us to, if we can, solve the problem. Lord, we pray that we would be in competition against evil, against foolishness. But Lord, in, in all things, we pray that we would look to our relationship with you because you are good and you are sovereign. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we conclude our service, let's stand and sing just one verse of hymn number 145. Hymn number 145, let's stand as we sing. just sitting and listening to you. And Lord, we pray that in all things we would hear you. Lord, we thank you that you have been involved in so much of what we have done. And Lord, we pray.